First Samuel chapter one. Brother Ryan's got our song tonight. He'll come and then we'll have our survey. Come on, Brother Ryan. First First Samuel chapter one tonight. Survey of the Bible. We'll enjoy this book, Brother. Ryan. Out of your hands, you've done all you can do. You've given God the problem, it's no longer up to you. You've prayed the prayer of faith, you're standing on God's truth. While you're waiting on an answer, He has a question for you. Is anything God, who's got a problem beyond His power to solve? Are there situations He's not the master of? Is anything too hard for God? Only believe. Trust His Word, you'll see. His plans are now unfolding, performing perfectly. It's clear how much He loves you. Look at all He's done. For all your questions, there is really only one. Is anything too hard for God who's got a problem beyond his power to solve are there situations he's not the master of is anything too hard for God is anything too hard for God Problem beyond his power to solve are the situations he's not the master of. Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? Enjoyed that tonight. That was good. All right, let's look at the book of 1 Samuel for a few moments tonight. Verse number 20 in chapter 1. Our Bible says, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come, about after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the book of 1 Samuel, named after the man we just read about there in verse number 20. Dear Father, please help us tonight as we look at your book. Teach us a little bit something from this uh, this book in your Bible tonight. That will be a challenge to our hearts, and we'll thank you for it. Thank you that there's nothing too hard for you. And, oh God in heaven, we've called upon you tonight to do some things that are way beyond our control. And then look, look forward to, Lord, hearing how you answer those prayers. So God be with us. Be with us in the remainder of the service time. We'll thank you in Jesus' name and amen. After the period of the judges, uh, at the book at the end of Judge, at the end of the book of Judges there, God uh, raised up Eli and Samuel as leaders of Israel. It was under Samuel's leadership that Israel made a big mistake, okay? Israel grew tired of a theocratic government and requested a monarchy. Now, a theocracy, we talked about this last week, a theocracy simply means God governed or God ruled. And what we said last week was this, God gave the children of Israel His commands and His laws, and they were expected to make themselves accountable to His laws and the commandments that He had given them. The judges were not there to enforce the laws and the commandments on the people. The judges were there to help explain the commands and the laws of God in case there happened to be any confusion in the minds of the people about a certain law or a command. That's all the judges were supposed to do. 
God really expect God really wanted to rule in the life of the individual Israelites. God ruled. God governed. Here's my law. Here's my book. Here's my commandments. Live by it. Okay? God governed. God ruled. Now, when Samuel was a, was a ruler over the, the, the judge, he was the last judge over the nation of Israel. He was also a priest. He kind of held both offices there. Uh, the Israelites came to him, and they said, we want to be like other nations. We're tired of this theocracy. We want a monarchy. We want, we want a man to look to. We want a man to come in between us and God and represent God to us and so forth and so on. And we see all these other nations, and so they requested that the government be changed from one of a theocracy to one of a monarchy. Now look at chapter number, well, let's do this first. Look back at chapter at Numbers chapter 13. And we'll get back in the book of 1 Samuel in just a minute. Let's go to Numbers chapter 13. This was a big mistake Israel made when she desired to be like all nations. Now, she, actually, there were three mistakes Israel made in relationship with other nations. And I'll be honest with you, folks. I believe they're an example to the United States of America. And uh, look, what she, look what the Bible says in Numbers 13 and verse number 31. The first mistake she made, Israel was afraid of other nations at Kadesh Barnea. We already looked at this verse in our study of Numbers. But the men that went up with him said... We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. So they were afraid of other nations at Kadesh Barnea. Israel was. The second thing Israel did wrong is found in Judges chapter 2. So turn there with me on our way back to 1 Samuel. Judges chapter 2. After being afraid of other nations at Kadesh Barnea, Israel mixed with other nations in the land of Canaan. So she mixed with other nations. Judges chapter 2. And verse number 1, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and said, I have made you to go up out out of Egypt, and have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of this land. Ye shall throw down their altars. God said, "Here's, here's the contingencies for my covenant. You don't make any league with the people who live in the land, and you throw down their altars. Look what he said at the end of verse 2. But ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have ye done this? If we took the time to look back in chapter 1, you would read, friend, in chapter 1, where the children of Israel, this tribe went in, and instead of casting out the people that were already in the land, they made a league with them, and they lived with them. So, in Judges chapter 2, when they went into the land of Canaan, Israel mixed with other nations. So, they were afraid of other nations in Numbers 13. And they mixed with other nations in Judges chapter 2. Now we go to 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. Two mistakes they've already made. Here's the biggest one. All right? She was afraid of other nations. Then she mixed with other nations. And then she imitated other nations after getting settled in the land of Canaan. Israel chapter 8, verse number 5. The elders of Israel, verse 4. Elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel unto Ramah. And said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Okay? Look at it, verse number 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. Samuel's trying to talk them out of this. Okay? And they said, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, this is not what God wanted. It was a theocracy. It was a God-ruled, God-governed situation. And God was the one who would go out in front of the, in front of the nation of Israel and fight the battles for them. They had seen that happen many times in the land of Canaan. But they got their eyes on the other nations. And pretty soon, they wanted to imitate the government of other nations. So they were afraid of other nations. They mixed with other nations. And they imitated other nations. Now, here it is, folks. God had chosen Israel to be a peculiar people unto himself. Okay? He had chosen to be a peculiar people unto himself. And their fear of other nations, and their mixing with other nations, and their desire to imitate other nations was displeasing to God. In becoming like other nations, they lost their peculiarity. They lost their uniqueness, and that was their strength. 
Their strength was in the fact that they were not like other nations. Their strength was in the fact that they were peculiar to God. Their strength was in the fact that He fought their battles for them. Their strength was in the fact that He went out in front of them. Their strength was in the fact that they didn't mix with other nations. And their strength was in the fact that they didn't imitate other nations by having the same kind of government they had. They were God-ruled. So when they lost their peculiarity, they lost their strength. Are you listening tonight? When they lost their peculiarity, they lost their strength. When they lost their peculiarity, they lost their uniqueness. Which what God had designed for His people. But they were to be strong and very courageous because God was their help. There was no need to be afraid of other nations. Hadn't God defeated that? Hadn't God knocked down the walls of Jericho? Goodness gracious. Hadn't God done wonderful things in helping settle the land of Canaan? Hadn't God made the sun stand still for Joshua? Hadn't all of that happened at the hand of God? They didn't need to be afraid. They should have lived with a boldness, a holy boldness, because God was their refuge. God fought their battles. They were to, be, they were to separate themselves unto God. Because he was a jealous God. And his name is jealous. They said, you're my people. You need to be separated unto me. So they were not to mix with other nations. And they were not to learn the ways of the heathen. They were to live by the statutes, the commandments, the precepts, and the truths of God's word. And when they became fearful and they started to mix and eventually imitated with other nations, they lost their peculiarity. They lost their strength. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You say, well, that's Old Testament. That's the, that's the nation of Israel and so forth and so on. But the same principle applies today in New Testament Christianity. And I'll show you this. Look at Titus chapter 2. Hold your finger here in 1 Samuel. We're going to go back here in a moment. Look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2 is in our New Testament. Titus is a pastor, was a pastor. Paul left Titus on the island of Crete. Okay? And he left him there to set in order the things that were wanting. There were several churches on the island of Crete. And Paul left Titus there said, Titus, I want you to ordain elders in the churches. And I want you to help set the things in order that are out of order in the churches. There were some problems. Get them ironed out. Now listen to me, folks. Just as Israel was the bride of God and was responsible to him. So we are the bride of Jesus Christ. This is not replacement theology. We didn't replace Israel. Israel is the bride of God. We are the bride of Jesus Christ. Okay? Now look at Titus chapter 2 and look at verse number 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope of the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, watch it now, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, save us, and then purify unto himself. Hey, what kind of people? Peculiar people. Zealous of good works. A unique people. Now, when you look at verse number 12 there, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What is that? Do you know what that is? That is biblical separation. Uh, a lot of Christians only practice one half of separation, and some practice none at all. Separation is two-sided. It is from the world unto God, unto Jesus. And this is what he talked about here. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, separating from that which is wrong, and then we should live godly, soberly, and righteously in this present world. That's separating ourselves unto. When Christians in this New Testament church age lose their separated position, they lose their strength. Our, our strength is in our separation. Our strength is in our peculiarity. And the, the, whole, the whole temptation right now is to, you know, uh, is to throw away all standards of separation, be they ecclesiastical or personal, and live like the world, talk like the world, walk like the world, so that we can win the world. When we imitate the world, we lose our peculiarity. We lose our uniqueness, folks. Look, Willow Creek, they came out last year in 2008. 
the, the, the Bill Hybels, the, the pastor of Willow Creek Community Church in Barrington, Illinois, which is the model church for all contemporary ministries, Rick, Rick Warren's ministry included. And I, and he disappointed me when he didn't pray in Jesus' name like he said he would at the inauguration. He cited the Lord, he cited the model prayer. Thine be the glory and the kingdom and the power forever and ever. Amen. But he said he was going to pray in Jesus' name. By the way, did you see your president had his first interview with an Arab television station? And he told them we're not, his, we're not their enemies. And he said he's got Muslim relatives and lived in a Muslim country and we're going to have to learn how to get along. That didn't take long, did it? And I don't think he's a born-again Christian. And I wasn't glad to see him take office. I didn't look forward to his administration, like some of our brethren said they did. But anyway. We lose Barrington, up here, Barrington. The model church for all contemporary ministries. I mean, the model church. And he said, we have done a great job at assembling a crowd. But we have been an absolute failure in making followers of Jesus Christ. Now, when we lose, but you say our separated position is so peculiar. Bingo. I don't have a prize to get out, but you won. Bingo. That's exactly right. And that's where we get our strength. That's where we get our uniqueness, folks. And it's not, separation is not a badge of pride to wear around like we're better than everybody else. It is, it is, it is for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. It is a testimony that we are, we are trying to be less and less like the world and more and more like our Savior Jesus Christ, who, who died for us, gave himself for us, that he might purge us from all iniquity, redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people. So we, we dare not lose our separated position. Alright? Just like Israel being the bride of God, we're responsible to Him to be a unique and peculiar people. So we are the bride of Jesus Christ, and He desires the same characteristics in us. Doesn't He desire us to be bold and not fearful? And hasn't He given us the Holy Spirit power to make us bold? And the truth of the matter is, friend, when we get fearful, that's when we, all of a sudden, we, we, we get afraid of the world. We get intimidated by the world. We don't want to look different, talk different, behave different, have a different spirit or attitude. We don't want to be any different because we're fearful. We, we don't want... So we start mixing with them and the next thing you know we're imitating them. And New Testament Christianity's lost its peculiarity, lost its uniqueness, lost its strength. Now I'll say again... There are no perfect people in this church, starting with the man standing behind this pulpit tonight. But I really don't care how big this thing gets. Far more concerned with building people who are followers of Jesus Christ. That has been the emphasis in Shelby. And I know sometimes it looks like we got people going backwards instead of forwards, but and that may be true, but we got people going forwards instead of backwards. And I think in a New Testament church, you're going to have kind of some of both all the time. But we're not going to change the emphasis to fill the building. And not going to change the emphasis to pay the bills. By the grace of God. Alright? So, we don't want to lose that peculiarity. Listen, I, I know... I know that the inner part of our, our, our spirit and our attitude is, is, is just as important as our dress and our behavior, everything else public. I understand it all works together, friend. But I want to tell you something. We don't realize what, we don't realize what both, both working together creates. It creates a unique spirit and a unique atmosphere. 
So let's just keep the old separated paths. Let's just separate from the world unto Jesus Christ. Not with an air of pride or I'm better than you. Or I'm, I'm more holy than you. But I'm not interested in how I compare to you. How am I with Jesus Christ? That's what matters. Okay? In that position of separation. All right, let's go back now because they made this horrible mistake. And uh, they want to be like other nations. We're not going to get into, any more into that. Now, let, let's go to chapter 3. Let me finish up with a little different uh, section out of the book of 1 Samuel here. The, Samuel's name means heard of God. Okay? Actually, twofold meaning. Asked of God and heard of God. This is a reference, of course, to his mother's prayers for a child. She was heard of God. She testified that uh, the Lord had heard her concerning the birth of her child. But this meaning could also be a reference to the call of God on Samuel's life that came to him as a young boy in the temple. I like that. First Samuel chapter 3, we've got that. And there is a lot of symbolism in the call of Samuel. A lot of symbolism in the call of Samuel. Look at verse number 1. Look at what the Bible says. Chapter 3, verse 1. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And here's this phrase. Watch here. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now, you understand this is before the word of God has been completed. God was still giving His word. Okay? Revealing it to the men who were putting it on paper and parchment and so forth and so on. The Bible says, in those days, the, Lord, the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open, open vision. Some of you adults were upstairs last week with Brother Jason, but I talked last week about, remember when we studied the book of Judges, we talked about the cycle. We talked about uh, forsaking the, 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 command, the way of God, and then oppression would come, and then repentance, and then deliverance. And then forsake, and then oppression, and repentance, and deliverance. And it, I said last week, you adults that were upstairs, it wasn't as much a cycle as it was a spiral. Because the Bible says, when one generation forsook the Lord, got in oppression, repented, and then had deliverance, they didn't come back as close as the previous generation. And when that generation went away, they corrupted themselves. Remember the key word? More. So they're not doing this. They're doing this. You with me? Okay. So, because of the spiraling digression in the spiritual condition of the nation of Israel, God was not speaking as frequently to them as He had in the past in the days of Moses and Joshua. In the days of Moses and Joshua, man, the, the Word of the Lord came often to those men. And now that we're in the book of Judges, that time period when every man did that which was right in his own eyes, his voice had, st had started becoming less frequent. The Word of God was precious. If I have a precious stone, what, is, what does that mean? It's a what? Rare. So the Word of God was rare in those days. There was no open or obvious channel through whom God was speaking. It was rare that God would speak. That's dangerous. Now, we have the completed Bible today, and you say, well, there's time. We, there's not, that won't happen now because we've got the completed Bible and God speaks through His Word. But is God speaking to you? Just because we hold the Bible in our hands doesn't mean that God is using it to speak to our hearts. Okay? So that's a dangerous thing. It's, it's a bad thing in the nation of Israel here, okay? The Word of God is frequent. It's rare. It's no, there's no open or obvious channel through whom God is speaking. Verse number 2. Here's some more symbolism. Verse number 2. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. Now, look, the biggest problem was not that Eli had grown older. But that he had laid down on his watch over Israel. He had become negligent. You know where his biggest negligence occurred? With his own sons. Who were committing adultery at the door of the tabernacle. And he came to them and said, Oh boys, this is not good. Shame on you. You shouldn't do this. He should have kicked their carcasses. He should have cleaned up his own family. But he laid down on his watch. I was going to show you that in chapter 1, but I'm running out of time. 
And, and why was this important for him? Because of the priestly succession in his family. Are you with me? His boys were next in line. He failed in his priestly responsibilities. And as he did, his ability to see, to judge his own boys was dimmed. So watch it now. We've got a situation where God is rarely speaking to his people through anybody. There's no open vision. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. And you've got a priest who is laying down on his watch. Laying down on his watch. You know, when we have personal spiritual character tragedies here in Faith Baptist Church, you know, I take it very, very hard. I don't like to see those things happening on my watch. You with me, church? I don't like to see families go into divorce. I don't like to see people getting out of church and young people wrecking their lives on my watch. Samuel is not taking care of business in his own family. He couldn't see. His eyes are dim. It's not that he's just getting old, but his, his effectiveness on his watch is not what it ought to be. Now, wait a minute. And then verse number 3. Look at the continued symbolism here. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. You know what happened in the, t- in the temple of the tabernacle? At evening, the priest was to refuel the candlestick. The candlestick was never to go out. And every evening, the priest would go in and refuel the candlestick. And it would burn till the morning and through the next day. And at evening, the priest would come in again and refuel that candlestick. And it burned through the night into the next day. And Samuel, Samuel laid down to sleep at the time when the fuel in the lamp was running low. And the flame was real dim. Now let's add it all up. No fresh vision. No Holy Ghost judgment. No fresh fuel. You know what Israel's doing? She's running on fumes. Every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. The place is chaos. They're mixing with other nations. They're fearful of other nations. In their hearts, they're already starting to want a monarchy instead of a theocracy. They they are running on fumes. There's no fresh word from God. There's no accurate and concise judgment of the Holy Ghost. There's no fresh fuel. She is running on fumes and about to go under. And then you come to verse 4. The Lord called Samuel. I love it. (laughs) A young man laid down to sleep. Sam. Don't you think he probably called him Sam? Maybe Samuel. Sam. Samuel. He goes running down the hallway to Eli. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What? You call me? No. Go back to sleep, son. You bother me. You bother me, boy. Get away, Father. You know. <laughs> Samuel. Three times. And finally, Eli, enough spiritual discernment left, and that old priest who has basically given up on his watch over Israel and not corrected his own sons and letting sin go rampant, and he, 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 at least enough spiritual discernment the third time to say, Son, I think somebody, I think God may be calling you. And you look down at verse, what is it, verse number, <coughs> excuse me, verse <coughs> number um, nine. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be if he call thee that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant hear it. That's exactly what happened that last time God called and Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Now, you know what? That makes me excited because here's a nation that's just about to go under. No fresh word from God. No Holy Ghost judgment. No fuel. On the last leg, spiraling down almost into the abyss. And God says, you know what? It's not time for that nation to go under. Samuel. Amen. Raised up a prophet. 
He raised up a man. And how many times do we see that repeated in the Scripture over and over again? I don't have time even to go there tonight. But the same thing happened after God gave him the first gift. I said, okay, you want a king? Here you go. He says, you got Saul. And he's going to make you miserable. And he did. And then he disobeyed God. And God came to Samuel and said, Samuel, I'm done. Saul's out. And it grieved Samuel. And he mourned and he had to go tell Saul, it's over. And the Bible says he grieved all night. He wept and mourned over King Saul. And I love chapter 16, verse number 1, after it says Samuel mourned all night, that God basically told him, I'm paraphrasing now, Samuel, okay, you've wept and you cried. It's time to dry your tears. I have prepared a king. You know who that was? The little shepherd boy out there. I love it. I'm going to tell you, folks, when it gets as bad, as bad as it may get spiritually in a country, it seems like God always has a voice through which to speak. Think about this. Even in the tribulation period, God still raises up two men through whom He speaks. I'm here to tell you, man, America's in bad shape. I, 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 I am, I'm absolutely just... Sometimes I sit and I just say, what in this world? I heard a, a, a fun, independent, fundamental, well-known Baptist preacher say, he said, Obama is a born-again Christian. I'm excited for him and looking forward to his administration. He must have been raised a Democrat. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to tell you, we're, we, this thing is, are y'all, are y'all, I don't know we can't read newspapers and listen to all this, but Iceland's government topples. Muslims in the, the Muslims over in, in the, the, the European nations are so afraid of the Muslim country right now, Muslim people right now, it's unbelievable. They're infested with them. And our president's standing up there saying, you know, I've got family members that are Muslims. We're going to have to get along. I'll tell you, folks. You say, oh, no, it's horrible, it's awful, God's done. <laughs> Not so fast. Not so fast. Not so fast. Not so fast. That's, that's not my business or yours. That's His. And you know, in some churches it becomes a popular thing to surrender to the call of God. Sometimes it's sincere. Other times it's an emotional response. And I thought back over 18 and a half years here, it's never been the, really the thing to do amongst our young men over these years. You know, well, I'm going to go because somebody else got called. But God has called some young men to surrender, and they have. And young men, sitting here tonight, and I don't mean just teenage men, I'm talking about some of you boys, Samuel's age. God ever comes your way in the, in the quiet of the evening and calls your name. You report for duty. Like Samuel did. Speak, Lord. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm going to tell you what, until God finally pulls the plug on this thing, friend, I believe with all my heart He'll be calling young men out. He'll be calling young men. He'll be raising up men through whom He can speak and work. And when it looks the darkest, God just might have a Samuel on the horizon. When it looks the darkest, God might have a David. Now, he may not. But I'm telling you what, I, I take great encouragement in this. No fresh word from God. No, no, no accurate, concise Holy Ghost judgment. No fuel in a country running on fumes. About to go under until God says, Hey, Samuel. <laughs> I love it. What a God. What a God. Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Thank you for listening. Dear Father, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts. And Lord, help us. My heart's burden for my nation, our country. But Lord, I am not despairing. I believe with all my being, God, that until you're ready to pull the plug on all of this, 
You're going to raise up men through whom you can work and speak. And There might be one even in our midst, God. And I just pray for the young men in our church that, Lord, they'll be yielded. That's what I ask. Yielded. We don't need any preacher called, and daddy called, and mama called, and Sunday school teacher called men. We need some God-called men. And God, please, if ever in the night you speak out, Lord, I pray for that college student that I talked to on Monday. Stirring in the heart. Unsure if it's the call of God or some emotional desire. Lord, I pray for that college student that you'll please speak to him. Make your will clear. Bless the young men of Faith Baptist Church. Help us, O oh Lord, as a people in this New Testament dispensation not to lose our peculiarity and uniqueness. And Lord, not just in how we dress and where we go, but Lord, our spirit, our attitude, our behavior. Oh God, please. It's a dark day. But the, the darker the night, the brighter the light shines. Make it so, O oh God, I pray in Jesus' name.